Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Think Local App Personal's latest webinar. If you build it, will they come? With a very clear reference to uh, Kevin Cosner film there, um, Field of Dreams, uh, where he builds a, a, a baseball stadium, uh, stadium in the middle of nowhere um, because he dreamt it, and then people came uh, to see the match there. Um, so we're going to be uh, relating that to can personal budget stimulate a diverse market? And uh, we see um, that Angela from uh, Comcast is uh, uh, listening uh, intently. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, Angela following uh, the first soft to support learning set as part of the Social Care Innovation Network, where um, the participants uh, were talking about uh, the work to stimulate new markets and uh, how self-directed support uh, in the policy uh, agenda would you'd expect people to be able to use uh, direct payments and, and, and uh, uh, purchase new kinds of supports um, and there was a real nervousness about well actually if we build it uh, will they come and, and buy new stuff different stuff uh, to meet social care need um, so we, we asked uh, community catalysts if they would uh, come and talk about their work. And I'm really pleased that um, today we've got Helen, uh, Helen Allen from Community Catalyst and Rachel um, from our own uh, NCAGU users, uh, micro providers down in Somerset. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Hello, yes, I got the short straw because Angela got us on this gig and then I was asked to do it. But I'm very pleased that I'm here today. So I'm Helen, I'm, I'm the Operations Manager from Community Catalyst. And hi, I'm Rachel Mason. I'm a family care of two adult sons in their 30s now, having a really, really good life in the community um, by using uh, direct payments and uh, micro providers in Somerset. Great. So, with no further ado, Helen, can you tell us about... Um, community Catalyst work in this space? Yeah, so we were established in 2010. We're based up in Harrogate, but we work across the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, I spend my life on trains, planes and automobiles, working with lots of different councils. Um, and the reason I get up in the morning to do that is we just want people to have a real choice of great services and supports that help them to get their good life. Uh, we want people to be connected into the community. We do this by helping local people look at what they're good at to set up tiny little enterprises that offer that real choice that people can then buy with their direct payment. Throughout today, Rachel and I will probably use different words. So just to say, you may hear the word community enterprise, you may hear the word community micro enterprise or micro. We're talking about the same stuff. It's local people doing great stuff for other local people in their communities. So just before we do move on, I've just realised that I've just jumped the gun slightly. Uh, I should have said to people, uh, the, use the chat function to ask your questions, <coughs> let's get those rolling in so we can summarise uh, themes that are coming in, do ask questions as Helen's talking and then we'll, uh, we'll reach a point where we'll address some of those questions. As you're using the ch chat function, just be aware um, that uh, if you, you need to be comfortable with the naming that you've put, it, put in there, because this is public. Uh, it goes in the public domain, so type stuff that you're comfortable with going in the public domain in that chat box. Sorry to interrupt That's your right. flow there. No problem, no problem. So what we're going to cover is the vision, um, what, the, what the hard stuff is, what the solutions are to that. Um, I'm going to talk about three areas where we've um, been working, where some really good creative use of direct payments is coming in. That's Leeds, Rotherham, Somerset, and that's where Rachel and I have worked together in Somerset Absolutely. many years ago, and then lots of time for um, for questions as well. So um, yeah, so we're we're really pleased. So the vision is about supporting people to get the help they need to live the life their way. Uh, we love social care futures um, summary of where where we want to be. We're going back even to 2007, putting people first. We thought brilliant personal budgets, direct payments, give people the choice self-direct their own support, Care Act, fantastic, legal duty now for councils to provide people with a personal budget. So giving people that upfront allocation in a personal budget is brilliant, but actually it's 
really difficult. So the challenges are actually giving people control of the money is only half the answer. Um, we need the choice of services and support for those people to spend it on that can really help those individuals get a good life. My life is different to your good life, Martin, to Rachel's. We need that choice and people need to be able to buy those services without any blocks in the system. Um, so yeah, control isn't really, doesn't result in choice. If we get the choice and then we actually say, mm, you are only allowed to buy X, Y and Z, um, quite often the support isn't there, isn't available for people to make good use of a direct payment. Often control and choice, it slips off our, off our tongues in, in, in this space, but actually for people it can be so complex, confusing. We, talk, we used to talk about individual budgets, then it was personal budgets, what's a direct payment? We talk about ISFs. It's a complex language that quite often people will just stick with what they've been given before. So we do know direct payments offer control, but not always choice. In a lot of areas where we work, um, historically, the push has been personal budget, take a direct payment, and perhaps employ your own staff, which absolutely is right for some people, but often it can be pretty tricky. Um, trying to find a PA is pretty tricky. The budget doesn't allow it. People don't want the responsibility, or they haven't got the capacity, actually, to employ somebody. So it can be really, really um, hard to do. Um, so some of the challenges that we found, now, that there were some... <laughs> There were some statements on this slide yes, that have disappeared. We've just got a man here with a strange face. So some of the challenges that we've seen on the ground that we know, um, again, uh, that the direct payment rates and support systems are based on the assumption a person will employ. Uh, we talk about hourly rates. Actually, people don't live lives in hours. Enterprises that we support might charge sessionally. They might not charge at all, actually. Um, there's a, 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 quite a lack of clear information about personal budgets, that what they can be used for. The paperwork monitoring for people can put them off. They, they can be for social workers, complex processes that they just think, actually, you know, this is just too much bother. Um, there can be a risk aversion, actually using some of the new stuff that isn't regulated, that's small, is scary. Sticking with the big CQC stuff, which doesn't always get people the right outcomes, is often that's you know that that safe place to be. So <clears throat> for us, we knew that actually giving somebody a direct payment is half the answer. What we need is that choice. We've got to build that supply, and it doesn't come on its own. And then people will demand it. So that's what we do. We help local people um, to set up little enterprises. We work alongside CVSs, and we know there's people out there that want to do it. So the people we work with are community micro enterprises, very very small. They're not PAs, they're not employed, they might be self-employed, they might be a social enterprise, um, but they're, they're small, local, and they want to help people. And if we get loads of those in an area, we've got that choice that then enables more people to take a direct payment and think, actually, I really can go shopping now. Uh, there's loads of good stuff about that, in inclusive wealth building and all sorts we're on to now, mm. but we won't talk about that today. So this is quite a, this isn't a complex slide to me because we talk about it all the time, but on here, um, I want to get to the stories really. So the bit that Community Catalyst does is on the right hand side, the green people. So we know there's local folks out there who want to help people. They need advice, they need business advice, and they need to know what a quality service looks like in the absence sometimes of CQC. So we can do all that. A lot of the stuff that we do, that, that we need to make this work, we've got to start with the left-hand side of the bridge, which is with people. They've got to understand what they want and need. If they've only ever been told about day centres or dom care services or day services, they're never going to know what else is available. So they need to have some, some really good conversations. They've got to have the money to pay for the support. Um, they've got to have good information. So on the grey bit on the bridge, as we start coming over now, We've got to know what's out there. We've got directories and all sorts, but often it only includes the big stuff. Um, advisors, and this is uh, crucial to us, they, the social workers support planners need to feel professionally safe to be creative, so to step away from the framework agreements, encourage somebody to take a direct payment and buy this new stuff. The other crucial bit, which is obviously what we're talking about today, is that through a direct payment, the money can flow without any barriers um, to that. So for some um, examples, um, so, so that we bring both sides uh, to the middle of that, that um, bridge, I'll talk a little bit about so three areas where we are working. 
So the first one I'll talk about is Leeds. Um, great forward thinking council, real commitment to creative stuff. They've got neighbourhood networks, there's so much great stuff going on. Um, and we're just one little bit of, of, um, of the jigsaw. We did a diagnostic, we looked at the bridge and looked at what the blocks were on that bridge. Now there the direct pay, oh, the focus is to help lovely older people like the lady in the picture to get a good life, home care, home support, lots of stuff, not in boxes that can help people get that good life. Some of the challenges, that, well, let me tell you, we've got a wonderful woman called Elaine, employed for two years. She's working with 47 people who want to offer that care and support. We're helping them through an advice framework to look at the quality stuff. We are doing it right standards. What we had to work with with the council was the hourly rate they had for direct payments was very much around personal assistance. Community enterprises have different overheads and what have you, and they've agreed a different rate for those guys. So actually, there's more likelihood to get people to want to set up these enterprises. We've, um, but linking all of it up, they've managed to um, with us to use our standards to get people onto their existing directory. We don't want to create different directories onto their lead directory where providers on there get a green tick if they're offering personal care. Our guys couldn't do it, they've now created it. So I've got a little example here of a great woman called Tina. Um, she's on the Leeds directory. If you can see on the right, there's a little green tick. Social workers now know she's been checked enough, not too many hoops, and they can encourage people to take a direct payment to pay for Tina's support. She's brilliant. I spoke to her just to get permission for this, and she was telling me about painting a shed for an older lady that made her happy when she looked out every day. She does the whole range, personal care, companionship. She even went with this lady to scatter her husband's ashes. Now, brilliant. That lady's a self-funder, and we're working with the council to make sure that social workers understand these new choices and to connect them. We do that through speed networking and all sorts of things. So great stuff is, is, um, is happening there in Leeds. In Rotherham, this was very much focused on helping people with a learning disability to get a good life. Um, the council there, there was lots of day centres, but as per the Care Act, Clause 5, I can tell you all about that, Martin, if you like <laughs> to, uh, create the diversity, quality. Mm. They wanted people to have the choice because they knew then actually people would be more likely to take a direct payment. So, um, and it doesn't just happen, we know that, you know, for years people have gone to day centres because that's what we've said is the right thing to do. So we have to help people, the culture of families, to think differently, to put the toe in the water. We can't just tell them. So we found loads of great stuff in Rotherham. We've done this in many areas. There's loads of great stuff out there. And we've just helped the people with a learning disability to have a taste of it. So we organised taster sessions, which were brilliant in Rotherham. The staff enabled us to work with people with learning disability to come out of the day centre and try new stuff. Over ooh, three years now, Harry, our local catalyst there, has supported about 17 enterprises, and there's a real choice of stuff now. So people from the bottom up are saying, actually, I want a direct payment because I want to go to some, to some of these things. So uh, just a couple of... You can't really get a flavour, but... This is an um, a, a, a enterprise called uh, Dex Life Skills Rotherham. Lee that works with, and this is very, um, Lee is actually a builder. Fantastic entrepreneur, realised for his kids there wasn't anything for them to do, so we built a skate park, trampoline park. Then he's connected in with, um, he has some experience himself around learning disability and wanted to offer opportunities for folks. So now people can pay with a direct payment to go there and it's very much about employment and volunteering. So they can volunteer um, in his cafe to learn skills. Somebody else has learned to be a first aider. They, they can work in the car washing bit. It's amazing. He's got linked with Cafeta. So there's when people have got these skills, they can go on to kind of um, stuff in, in the community. It's not all about direct payments. He's also um, getting other, other funds through training organisations and what have you. So it's not solely about direct payments, but that is a, a key factor. Another one is artwork, so they were based in Sheffield, but they knew that there was, um, through our work there was an opportunity in Rotherham. So they'd come over, real funky, creative, not about doing art in a place that doesn't get out there, they connect with the community and projects and what have you. Every day now they've got people with a direct payment to, to, come, um, to come along. The council have done loads of stuff to enable their staff to understand what is out there, to think differently, under an initiative called my front door to enable everybody to get different a different view from their front door and then 
I'll talk about Somerset, which is actually one of our, um, we've been in, involved with Somerset for many, many years, which is where we met, wasn't it, Rachel? Yes, absolutely. Years ago. So this is a, was a partnership with all sorts of folks, county council, third sector, parish councils, GPs, village agents, you name it, we've created those, um, those partnerships. We employed a chap called Reese. Um, and he's been working there for many years, four years employed by us. Their whole, their, their main focus was about trying to get some support in those real rural areas. Reese took me in his car once somewhere, and it's like, Christ, yeah, when I'm in a car, I haven't seen anything other than a sheep and whatever. A girl from Manchester is not used to that. So they were totally understood for home care and for older people, they needed a good range of folks. Um, but actually, and we've got a lot of them, what was great was. So because Reese was there, people were coming forward, local people, to set stuff up, and that included micros that Rachel will talk about for people with a learning disability. Um, so over the over the, oh now this lady here, I'd like her to. So we were helping <laughs> lovely ladies like this, uh, and we've got loads of great stories. So over the four years that we were we were properly kind of there, we helped 425 um, micro enterprises offering uh, support to people. Loads of people now using them. At the early days, the direct payment take-up definitely increased. I think it's plateaued now, um, and that was very much, we linked with the direct payment support organisation that saw the potential of this. So we know that many uh, DPSOs are contracted to work only with PAs. They got that actually our guys were different, but they, they took that on board. Social workers got the directory, GPs got the directory, everybody, and actually, yeah, fantastic um, things have happened. And I think we're going to, oh, we're going to take a... Uh, I think we might just take a few questions at this point. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, Helen. So uh, we have got one or two questions, but uh, we're just going to just pause there. And please do ask your questions. So, um, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Um, it's good to hear from you again, Andrew. Andrew Power, uh, you might know. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew's asking, how are the councils supporting these enterprises to ensure they're sustainable or are they solely re reliant on people's direct payments? Well I think through our work um, that our, we have an advice framework and that's very one of the first things that we talk about is about sustainability. You can't rely just on direct payments. So for example Dex that I, I talked about earlier, he's an existing organisation that has income from other areas. The direct payments are just one of those aspects. Um, these guys go for different funding, for diff if, they, if they're doing arts, they might get funding through the Arts Council, Unlimited. There's, um, we also encourage them to be entrepreneurial. So artworks, for example, they make really good quality stuff and they sell it, that mm. comes back into the organisation. So it's not purely direct payments because actually, and this is some of the challenges, you know, direct, the amount of money in people's direct payments is not as much as it used to be. Um, we also encourage people, don't go get in a big building if you haven't already got one. Keep your overheads low. This is about people, lives, community, use, there's so much good stuff yeah. in the communities, which I mean Rachel will talk about earlier, that we don't need buildings, we don't need that, that's, that traditional stuff that that's great, expensive. That's, I mean, that's, that's people using direct payment but actually getting involved in enterprise as well. That's right. and, you know, uh, giving and making a contribution to society as well as. Yes drawing on resources and uh, needing support. We've yeah. got a couple more questions that we're going to just take at this point. Karen, hello Karen, uh, it's good to, good to see you online too. Uh, did, did the local authority offer start-up grants to support the start-up micro-providers? Well I'd say every area is different um, and I, we generally go with the view that there, are, there will not be any start-up grants because we know that councils, you know, there's very little money there. So if there, in some areas we've had little tiny amounts um, and actually these guys don't need a lot. Mm. For some people it might be they just need a little bit of a leg up to get a DBS check, to get their insurance, mm. to help with marketing, those types of things. But actually, like I say, we really encourage these guys not to have big overheads. Yes. Do and and might it be, I mean, I'm just going to ask you mm. to see what you think, but uh, and might it be that the councils thought about that, but actually it's choices, rather than offering micro, grant, micro uh, grants, let's get Comcats in mm -hmm. to do uh, to do the work they do, and that might be our, that's the way we're spending our, our money, is to get Comcats to in to the, do yeah. the stimulation. Yes, yeah, so possibly, yeah, they might absolutely. They make that choice, yeah. might they? Yeah, I mean, that's not to say that none, no, I think in the past they definitely have, I don't want to name authorities, but one definitely offered that money. We created a little process. 
you've got to make the process simple yeah. because if it's too complex these guys you know struggle to to get through it. but there are some areas there are but yes. we would normally go with actually we'd you know let's yeah. look in at other areas um avi is it avi um i think that's I, I might be saying that wrong uh, we've got a question from avi uh what are your views around uh, capacity requirement. Oh, cap uh, uh, questions around people's capacity in the Care Act uh, uh, and taking direct payment. Thinking about uh, the learning disability community and being able to direct your own support and address issues as they come up. I mean, what what do you think about that, Rachel? Uh, you know, in terms of using a direct payment to buy innovative, creative solutions uh, from micro providers. Uh, and thinking about capacity issues. Absolutely. So, so from a capacity point of view, uh, okay, people might say that my my sons knew that the, the the day services and the services that were offered to them wasn't working for them. They expressed that through their behaviours and their mannerisms. Mm. That to me was indicating to me things weren't working. That to me was them saying, "I want out of this, please." Um, now. Taking a direct payment because I was able to manage that for them, so I was what we called um, uh, the, the named person. Yeah, the person yeah. But if that isn't possible, as I said, I'm very passionate about individual service funds as well. Mm -hmm. So being able to still have a commission service, but working with an individual and their circle of support, um, so that the individual or their family don't actually have to take on the responsibility of running and, and being responsible for that that uh, uh, the personal budget as a direct payment legally, um, but can still have that choice and control and uh, co-production with an, a good named provider. And I do believe that, and I would expect one of the micro providers, if I was to pop my clogs, I think um, my husband would more than likely take an ISF. Um, and sit that with a micro provider to, to hold that. Mm. Okay. I think okay. as well, just one other thing. Uh, I was uh, at your event in Manchester the other day. Yes, I did. Yeah. Sat with a direct payment support organisation who talked about. Um, we we talk about people not wanting to take on the responsibilities of being a personal assistant, but sometimes actually they haven't got the capacity to to be an employer. The folks that we're talking about, you don't have to employ, so actually yeah. it's an easier arrangement yeah. for some people. Absolutely. Probably some some role for advocacy there. In, oh, in the absolutely, mix, yes, uh, yeah, uh, too. Yeah. Okay, so shall we move on to hear about yes. Rachel's experiences of using micro providers down in Somerset? Absolutely. Oh, so we're going to forget that one. Flick through a few of yeah, those, and then, then we can, I'll, I'll, I'll we can come back to, um, um, to yeah. those, those slides. Okay, okay so, so basically what I'm looking at is, is, is the, this sense of, you know, can citizens spending power make a difference in the market? Um, and I believe individuals like myself and the, and the success that we've managed with a direct payment uh, actually can drive, drive forward new ways of, of doing commissioning in adult social care. So you all know that a personal budget is an entitlement under the CARE Act and knowing the value of your personal budget and knowing what your life goals are is key. Because if you've got that, you know then whether or not you want to take a direct payment. But for me, it's the, the, the balance of that is are there enough choices and options out there for have something to buy it with? So this is that bit there when I'm saying people's individuals and individual and collective outcomes can begin to drive change. But it's going to be really important that local authorities and providers themselves start asking for and looking at the data, looking at what those trends are with what people like myself are buying with direct payments and see whether or not that can inform and stimulate a different and diverse market. Um, so uh, both Greg and Sean are now connected and here are a few photographs of them connected. To me they're incredibly valued by their community. Uh, they are skilled up with what I call community currency. So those are skills that they already had from school and college but also the different activities that they've done in the local community has now given them something that they can exchange, something that they can be um, uh, valued for. Now, we're talking, what, three, four years on after using micros, and they are now primarily, primarily supported by local people. 
and, and they've reduced their direct payments uh, budgets from 42,000, they're just under 9,000 pound now as a, as a direct payment. Now that hasn't been easy. When I first had that direct payment and I started approaching, you know, the traditional, you know, larger providers that are on the, the directories and that, that you see out there, um, they didn't want to take on parts of a small package. I didn't want to give more than um, a few hours for certain different activities, as you can see up there. Um, but there were larger providers saying that they only would take a package if I could give them a minimum of 30 hours that, that would then warrant uh, recruitment in the area that we were living in. Um, I didn't want to employ myself again because I'd be looking at, because I wanted the enablement, I wanted the connection and I wanted people to then step back, do themselves out of the job, uh, another way of looking at it. And so I didn't want to go down that employment route. So self-employment and self-employed micros looked very appealing. And actually, four of my son's old employed personal assistants, so that was when I had them more full time and I could offer them employment, they actually set themselves up as one of the, or four of the earliest micro providers in, in Somerset. Um, and another part uh, that I found really difficult was around adult social care. When they gave me, uh, for my sons, the five days a day service, they, there seemed to be an expectation that I name a provider that was going to do those day act daytime activities. So it was an expectation of opting out of a service, but you can have a direct payment to buy a service. But actually, I wanted to buy outcomes, and I wanted to be able to have two hours here, a session here, something from adult learning, something from something, and use the money creatively, which has given me the results that you see now. So actually, I did break the rules straight away. Okay, so for me, micro-providers, they're all local people. All right, so this is a kind of a representation of all the different uh, places that my son has a connection to uh, in the community. One thing I liked about micro providers is that they're not reliant on those long term hours from one person. I mean, I use Carolyn. Carolyn has got, oh gosh, 13, 14 individuals for one hour, two hours, for oh, yeah, five or six people on a single day, she works evenings, she works weekends, you know, her days are spread ac across her week. And it's not just as one as um, uh, one of the people that uh, wrote on the chat there about direct payments being their only income. A lot of who she supports are actually private people like you and me to do their gardening, to do their cleaning, to if there was somebody who'd actually lost their driving license and she was driving them around to work and things. But, she, but just being there and because she was a local person known by somebody that was local in the, the I won't say the, the church or anything because drink driving um, but anyway in the pub let's just say um, and and was able to be picked up that so it just goes to show how diverse um, micro providers can be now we've got to remember micro providers are self-employed people uh, under the HMRC rules so I do expect a micro provider to tell me what their availability is I expect them to tell me what they will and won't do and I have got pro micro providers that will not do certain things with my son, which is which is fair enough. They they have set out their stall, as it were. They have to give me notice of their unavailability, but I can't say you need to work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday from two until four. I actually have to fit around them, but it does work very, very well because there are times when if my sons are doing really well and they're doing things on their own, I might not need them a particular week. I don't want to employ them for the sake of employing them because they're contracted to do so, which is what we find within our commissioned contracts, don't we? 16 hours. It's sort of a bit of negotiation that. about that. Absolutely negotiation. Yeah. Absolutely negotiation. Absolutely yeah. negotiation. Um, and, uh, and then if they're ill, uh, the micro, micro provider will, will phone me up, email me, or just say, look, I'm not going to be able to do it. I can, I've suggested and I've made connections with the, uh, you know, uh, Rosemary is another one who will uh, say, okay, Rosemary will be able to cover me. I've sorted that. They have done their, they've um, uh, discharged their duty under HMRC, but it doesn't mean that I have to have Rosemary mm. if I don't want to. So, so that's really the face. Yeah. So, Having local people means that I can harness their local connections. So 
all the different places that my son participates in activities or has natural uh, connections with in the community. Uh, the church there, for example, where a micro that is within the church has helped me purely just to make those connect connections of walking down to church, being part of the chapel, uh, volunteering with the Sunday school and now volunteering with the luncheon club on a Monday that the church run um, and after gosh I'd say about six and a, six months seven months I'm not using that micro in a paid support now he is now going down and helping uh, play dominoes at that that chapel event on a Monday uh, with no support but that's what I call sustainable connections sustainable skills to walk down there to connect with with the people down at chapel give the people at chapel the confidence around his autism and his learning disabilities and what spikes his behaviors and how to manage them when they show them show themselves that micro has now done his job i don't i don't need that micro any anymore same happens to connecting him to the the shops go shopping um, playing sport uh, litter picking greg got a recent award somerset county council award for his litter picking um, and that was done with a micro provider that gave him the skills to do that responsibly and safely um, but he does the majority of those litter picking uh, role his job if you like uh, independently um, on his own now they're all confident all of the micros that i use are confident to facilitate those what i call real sustainable relationships within the community and then they step back they don't expect to have my son for the next 10 years mm. now that is where i i differentiate between micro attitude of micros and attitude of of, of mainstream adult social care providers um, and also, I, I think because the micros see themselves as local people and are seen by the local people as local people, there is a difference in attitude. Whereas when we see a, a dom care provider, especially if they're in a uniform, coming into someone's house to help them or come and do their shopping, the community step back. And yet with micro providers, because they're local people, you bump into the micro, oh, I saw you with Greg when they're sat there having mm. a drink in the pub, oh, I saw you with Greg doing such and such then they, the community feel part, feel yeah. part of, of, of that and, and join in. And I just wanted to say at this point, someone like um, Stephen there up, up, up at the chapel, um, I do have people that are on what I call retainers. So I actually pay £35 a week of a retainer so that you've got local people that can respond if some, Sean uses his ice card in any of the community shops and the shopkeepers phone that and I'm up in Hull or I'm working away, then the, they can actually respond. So I'm not booking them for any set amount of hours. There are weeks that I don't use them and weeks that, are, that, that I do. But I do use kind of a retainer system. Okay, motivation to take a personal budget. This is really key. Your conversation with the uh, social worker, whether that's at an assessment or review should identify what your life goals are and what the barriers are. The barriers are the, the bits that make you eligible as such. So after that, you'll then know if the services that you've got or are going to be offered are actually working or not. Just like me, I knew that there were services that weren't working. So when I took a direct payment uh, for the day services, I knew that they weren't working. They were miles away uh, and weren't actually addressing the outcomes for my sons. So I asked how much that cost and they said £255 and so I took a direct payment for that and started using that in a really diverse way. So this is a visual expression of that using Thomas as an example. So Thomas had been going to a day service for 17 years, again wasn't addressing any of his outcomes. So as you see that block of blue there that you see was £260 worth of service he had no control of. Sorry. There you go. So when we did some personal centre planning with Thomas, we identified that he couldn't do his own shopping. He couldn't actually stay in his own home independently, safely. Um, so we looked at what are the skills that he needed to do that? And were those skills actually being addressed at the day service? No, they weren't. So we took the direct payment and guess what? What we actually got out of that 260 pounds. There we go. We managed to get 17 and a half hours of local, which could be micro provider, one to one support in his own town from his own front door, learning how to stay in the family home safely, 
uh, accessing an adult learning course, doing a bit of volunteering, certainly doing a lot of connecting in the community, um, and we paid for a care line in the property as well so that we could, uh, for the times when he was in the pr property, his mother, who was five minutes down the road, uh, could actually respond if she needed to. Then after six months of using those independent local people um, in the same way as I did, connecting him to, to uh, uh, when I say local volunteers, just local people that were already going to the Slimming World, didn't need that one-to-one -one with them all the time. So they actually did themselves out of the job and it was much easier to reduce that day service package from that £260 and reduced it, what is it, down to uh, £105 after six months um, and it was going down and down, um, but uh, but we couldn't have done that. If he'd stayed in that day service, he would have been there for the next 20 years. Can, can I just ask you a question at, at this point, Rachel, because I might be throwing you off your, off your track, but we've got a question from Stephen, which I think this is relevant. He's, 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 Stephen's question was, do you have other measures of impact or outcome, uh, of, in, of impact and outcomes? Um, I mean, that question came from... from a, I think his experience is from children's services, but it's definitely relevant for adult social care. But this is a really well, different way of expressing impact and, and outcome. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so I I I use these um, these images um, uh, just so that I can see the red areas in my son's um, uh, grid, um, and then I chip away at them by using the micro providers, adult learning, volunteering, anything to try and turn them blue, which is independent. Yeah. Um, and and so I can I can give those to send those to my social worker regularly. I was going to say that. I, so I regularly so you, you, at review you, you discuss that with absolutely. Social and, and to be perfectly honest, I'm not on a regular review list no. because I'm I'm independent. Even if I had an ISF and these and there are some local authorities that are, are, are using this this tool to to get ISFs to, uh, people that hold ISFs yeah. to uh, uh, send in grids regularly to show the movement to show the progress. Mm -hmm from red areas, which is the one-to-one, -to, -one, to, to the blue or volunteering or cost-free. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think it's a, it's a motivation. I don't think we have it in a commission service. We don't have the conversation with the individual to, to aspire to be the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. And often the commission service with, they're given doesn't even, doesn't even set them mm -hmm. up to actually make any progress, especially mm -hmm. with our day services. So, so yeah. final slide. Um, and this was just a, a community expression, a, a representation of a community. When you've got direct payments, we pool budgets automatically. So Mark, Lisa, myself, uh, as parents, um, we've pooled budgets for different activities and, and had micros and then had a micro support on a one to three and they invoice us one third of the bill each for those activities. Much, much easier. When you've got residential care home or uh, uh, different providers in the same community and you try getting I'm not going to name providers but you try getting providers to say oh well, a third of the bill a third of the bill it's impossible and yet if we could get them over to individual service funds if not direct payments individual service funds then with those individual service funds if people came together from different settings different being supported by different providers you could use micro providers separate to yourselves um, and share the bills yeah. with it with an ISF. Lots to read about on ISFs on TLAP's oh, website. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think we're going to move to summarise now. Um, so Helen, would you like to just summarise some of the factors? Yeah. So I think to think about in the areas where we're working where it's working well, the the, the essential factor to success I think is that focus on strengths based, um, not strengths, not deficits, and that's very much that combined effort of people, carers, uh, communities, organisations, councils, a real partnership built on respect and trust, shared risk, shared endeavour. We know in areas where it's worked well, we've got to have that strong leadership to take some, uh, change some of the processes and some of it is just changing a few bits of that, of the, of the process to make great things happen. Um, it's difficult in, a, in, in councils where we've got a lot of churn, so that consistent approach is, uh, is really good. Um, and I think just being pragmatic and real makes these things, makes these things happen. So I think that's the, that's the good stuff. I won't go through the, um, the things that are still a bit of a yeah. challenge, because that might come up in conversations. Yes. So, shall we get straight into mm -hmm. questions then? Yeah. 
Okay, Absolutely. we've got lots of questions uh, already. Um, so, oh, you've got one there, Helen. I've got one here. How does the approach work for parents who don't have time capacity to arrange micro providers that work full time? It's probably a double edged thing with me and Rachel, isn't it, really? That, and what I would say is that the, um, the micro providers aren't employed, so you're free of that employment um, approach. So actually, you take your direct payment or your prepaid on your prepaid card. Um, you find the providers to, to offer the service, and then you just pay them uh, directly from your direct payment. In the areas where we work, we have directories, we have uh, e-market directories. We get people to link with the village agents to tell them what's what's available. Community navigators through social prescribing. So all the time we're trying to get information to families and what have you so they don't have to go looking for it we do the market events and that type of thing that's what i'd say from our side yeah. right? but i don't know what um, you'd... okay from from my point of view um and and, and quite rightly although the name of who wrote this question isn't on here um but i am doing an awful lot of work i do work full time mm -hmm. i i do um but i think there should be and this is something that i think local authorities need to think about there is uh, a brokerage element mm. that should be mm. within yeah. direct payments. Yeah. When somebody is actually looking to spending the time to actually find a micro provider that matches up with what the aspiration or whatever the task or skill is or whatever the mm. volunteering job needs to be and and do that. I think that is a bit that is mm. missing. I will be mm. honest. Um, I think within individual service funds that the, the the provider that's holding that, or the micro provider mm. that's holding that, um, or the or the uh, support brokerage yeah. organisation that is holding that, should be someone um, or or an organisation that should be paid uh, mm. to do that. Mm. But I think you've highlighted for me the direct payment support service that has been in the background behind my direct payments for 15 years has never have the capacity within what they've been contracted to do yeah. to deliver that. Yeah. That is the one bit I've always said has been missing. We yeah. contract PAYE, mm -hmm. we contract employment of, P of PAs, but I think there has to be an element of brokerage mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and built yet, within contracts for direct And again, service. we've been exploring that to uh, think local app personal. Read about that some of that stuff again on the website uh, in terms of support planning and then brokerage, you know, those functions. Uh, to get stuff working really mm, well, you need that independence. That information, like we're saying, yeah. is that. Uh, more questions. Yeah, yeah, there's another one here. How are staff in micro enterprises different from PAs? My PA will and does do a huge variety of tasks with me and for me. Um, again, and, and, and everything that we talk about is that choice. So we absolutely see for some people, a personal assistant is the way to go. Um, our, our enterprises, again, the offer that they give is they don't have to be. Um, they don't have to be employed by the person. They quite often start, well, they always start actually with their passion and their connections in the community. So it isn't just about the care side. They have nat natural connections and they're bringing mm. that passion to people, whether that is yoga or film or photography or music or what have yeah, you. Yeah, so I did see that uh, we had a, a question from Andrew earlier. Um, Andrew Power has done a lot of uh, academic work in this space actually. And he uses concept, and I know you've done similar academic work, uh, concepts of self-build care. It's a very different sort of approach. You, I guess it, what you're doing is piecing together your support mm. from really creative different. people, yeah. rather than getting all the support from one person That's assistant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there is, no, you're right. There is no right and wrong way no, as absolutely. far as doing this is concerned. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, uh, Catherine, when you're talking um, about... Um, you know what is the difference you know one is employed and one is self-employed yeah. and I, I expressed in my my slides there about the um, the not the, the rights but the, mm. you know the, the yeah. self-employed person actually is the service and you are asking them mm. rather than with an employed PA you are actually highlighting um, uh, what you want them to do and mm -hmm. it can be diverse and as wonderful as I did because I did employ PAs mm -hmm. I employed four PAs in the in the early days but as they I needed them less mm -hmm. and I couldn't keep them in full-time employment mm -hmm. so so I had to release them um, and they became self-employed micros so I was still so I, most of them. I got a question oh sorry we're no, no, to, so, uh, question from Dick sorry about the rustling there that was me selecting a question uh, David Williams asks how and I'd like to start off, start off with this, but see what you think about my responses. 
how do you decide which potential micro enterprises to support stroke fund? I think that's an interesting question. I'm not sure, David, whether you're an individual with a direct payment or whether you're a commissioner. I would say, actually, people individually need to decide that through good information and advice, like the kind of systems you've seen, it's about an individual choosing this stuff. It's not about a commissioner deciding what we're going to fund. Mm, what, do you, right. what do you think? So from, from Community Catalyst point of view, um, uh, so, we, so when we go into a council, they tell us where the gaps are, what is it that they need. So Rotherham, it was about day uh, opportunities for people with disability. In Somerset, it was the push for home care, but then it, it, it did get bigger than that as well. So just to say, we don't fund, Community Catalyst doesn't fund the enterprises. We support them to understand the potential through direct payments. And then, like you say, it's very much the person's choice whether they buy, buy, buy it or not. What, what Community Catalyst does is enable those enterprises, um, but we will only support those that are committed to um, doing it right. So we will only support those ones that want to develop good, quality, safe services that keep themselves safe and the customer. So if we've got somebody who wants to take a shortcut, who doesn't want to know about regulation, then actually we will say you're not right for our development programme. So in terms of the support, it's about those that have got the potential to be and commit to our development programme. They understand about CQC, whether they fall into it or whether they don't fall into it. And that's very much our USP. We've got the knowledge around that because we've been doing it for a long time. I can see okay. Rachel just summarising. Yeah, okay, so so I've, I've just looked at this, um, following on from what Helen was saying, that although they might be you haven't got the values for, for, to come on the scheme, anyone can set up mm -hmm. as a self-employed person. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we can't say that this is completely, um, you know, foolproof, mm -hmm. but the more transparent the more open because these are local people mm. and after they've done their job they're sitting in the pub they're using mm. the same library they're using the same church and the more transparent open and being seen you are mm. um, and if you are self-employed it's not worth your salt to actually provide a bad service Absolutely. word of mouth, is word thing, of mouth yeah. can keep you safer yeah. i feel than yeah. actually any kind of formal regulation yeah um, but I'm not saying that there, there aren't mm. or couldn't be rogues, mm. um, as there is in, in, in organised CQC, big services. Big yeah. services. It, yeah. it can happen. Mm. Let's, uh, let's take another question. Um, it's just a question there oh. that Louise has put about what about DBS checks? And I think that comes into the, exactly the, the same discussion, really. Is part of our doing it right standards is we have a number of those. DBS checks is just one tiny little aspect of that. And we will signpost people to um, organisations where they can get a DBS check. We also advise customers, uh, if we do our own little directory, we advise customers, um, you know, you're taking your money, you're making the choices, you've got some responsibility, actually you should be asking, because we don't ask to look at them, we ask the enterprises to self-declare that they've got them, but actually some of it is about advising customers to say, actually you've got a right to ask and insurance, Louise. Louise is asking about insurance yeah. as well. We've got Mark Bates on here, and uh, they're an organisation, uh, one of many, that we um, direct the enterprises to. So these are very much part of our doing it right standards, DBS checks, insurance, but they go on policies and procedures yeah. and all sorts. I think it's really interesting, because I know we've got a real mix of, of, of people on, on here. It seems we've got quite a few from children's. Mm. Uh, you know, in terms of the Care Act and adults, it's very clear that actually... You know, if you're employing, if you're employing yourself, or if you're buying, it's mm. by, it's by everywhere. There's no, no, yeah. there's no uh, forcing out TBS uh, checks. Children's is slightly different, of course. But, uh, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, I was, I was just going to chip in there from a, uh, from a, from a end user's point of view. Um, I do ask whether or not they've had their uh, a DBS. Mm. We've got. Um, I, I asked to see their their uh, HMRC return. Uh, so that they've got a UTR. I, I can't, sorry, a UTR, so that's a, a tax reference number, yeah. if you like. But just to make sure, I can't make sure that they put the right figures in. That's, no. that's none of my business. Mm. But I have discharged my duty to mm. ensure that they are paying their taxes. Um, I do ask for reference. Uh, and I have been on the end of emails and letters saying, um, uh, could you please tell me, I'm looking at uh, Kevin 
uh, what you think. So I've given references to individual micros, um, and micros mm. have asked me to answer references before. Um, but as I said, word of mouth and that, that local, that local, local yeah. um, uh, transparency, if mm. you like. And I think a good provider, if you are keeping everything covert and, mm. and not sharing and those sorts of things, that I'd say buy everywhere. And the lead scheme gives you some. The, the way they prevent the information. Well, the leads counsel absolutely. We're, we're, we're fitting into a, an existing way of the, the bigger providers getting the green tick to say the safe, yeah. that leads counsel have adopted our doing it right standards to say if they're meeting those, they also get the green tick. Which is tick. a promotion of doing a good good approaches, is it? It is. It's not, it's not yeah. for, a, a forced... You Absolutely, know, uh, no enterprises don't have to go through uh, it, but yeah. if they want that specific link back with social workers and to get that uh, the hourly rate, which is a little bit more, then they will jump through those hoops to uh, So to we're, do we're, it. we're running on time wise. Any more? Oh, sorry, Rachel. Yeah, I was just going to say we can't push all of the responsibility on the local authority no. for mm. the quality of providers. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes ourselves as, as, as end users or purchasers have got to be savvy. Mm. All right, so so if you've got your £50 for uh, opting out of a day service and one person is asking you, uh, a, a micro is asking you for all of that £50 for a day time of support, yeah, that's one-to-one, -one. that's pretty mm. good, so I'd pay that. If they've got, you know, two other customers or, or two other people that they're taking out with your son and daughter and you've got your £50, I would, I would negotiate, I would certainly start asking questions about... Why am I paying? Um, you know, why am I paying five hours of one to one when I'm on a on, on a one to three? So I would only expect to receive a third of that of that bill. I'd only be looking at a thirty pounds for that session because it's one to three. Um, so so for me, it, it is about negotiation. Mm, yeah. So having the That's confidence yeah. to do that. Okay, well let's take some quick questions because we're we're running on. And uh, one from Catherine here. Uh, does it work better in rural areas than cities? In terms of developing community enterprises, yeah. um, I guess we we have a big impact in the rural areas because there's more needs, there's more more demand. But that isn't to say that we haven't done this in other in other areas. We've we've run a couple of projects in uh, Newham, Bark and Dagenham. We're currently in Kingston. We're in Leeds. It's Leeds. Yeah, I was going to say. Bit, so, no, well, I yeah. think we've you've already given an example of a rural setting, a city, Rotherham, and a town. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, it seems to be able to work anywhere. Yeah. Uh, Avi is asking another question. Are there any examples of PA cooperatives that you work with community catalysts? Um, we, well, well, the thing to say is we don't work is no. uh, we don't work with personal assistants because no. we and, and I think this is a terminology that we have to get clear and it's very important because of HMRC yes. and CQC. So we don't work with PAs at all. So uh, we don't work with PA cooperatives as such. We might work with uh, a community enterprise that is um, identifying local people who want to offer support. But this is a whole discussion about when they then might come into the realms of CQC, CQC um, uh, regulation and what have you. So it, it's, a, it's a fine line, that really. This is quite deep, this one, Susan. Is there a culture where we have more focus on value for money rather than contract value and recognition? I mean, in terms of your experience, Rachel, I mean, taking the direct payment, I think you've talked already about, I mean, are you getting value for money? Yeah, and it's, you it's, think it's about value for money I, rather than... I, certainly with a, the with a direct payment, when I, uh, for example, when I opted out of the for, uh, the residential care that would have cost my, my uh, the local authority £1,700 a week to go to that residential care, mm. um, and yet, um, again, using that, that same sort of... Um, resource there to see how I could spend the £1,700 differently. I got lots of different one-to-one -one activity, mm. lots of different um, uh, sessions and use of micros and uh, different activities. And I got to, what, £890 and I couldn't spend any more. Mm. So so I think mm. it, I think sometimes direct payments, we are frugal. Mm. We, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. But I would never compromise great outcomes. But we yeah. are frugal. There's a question. For, I'm not sure if this is a question, Sandra, rather than a reflection on the current state of funding of adult social care. But uh, live at, uh, you live at home with family, but you have carers 24-7. Why have we not had no increase in budget uh, for over seven years? I think that's a question for Boris. Mm. I'm not sure, mm. but... Uh, 
that's uh, but you did talk about the differential in rates that have been negotiated in Leeds, which is quite interesting. Yes, it is. So in some areas, I think the councils are recognising that you know actually we do need to recognise that community enterprises uh, perhaps need that extra. But again, it's this whole thing of hourly rates, sessional rates. People don't buy you know care in, in boxes and what have you. Um, it may be care is twenty four seven. Yeah, it's difficult to, mm. to come up with individuals. Council, you've come across that. No, no, well, there's, to, to yeah. Well, well, well yeah, it's it, it's common on. and it's yeah it's come in different uh, in different ways really. Um, so yeah, but no, that is a difficult. Um, I've only had that one. I'm not quite sure what the question uh, is on that one. Um, how Kim, how does an organisation when councils are avoiding direct avoiding payments? direct payments? What help is it to get support they need? I think that's avoiding. I, I, I think that's where where we talk about we talked about uh, perhaps in Rotherham is. We have to enable um, some of the barriers around direct payments. I think are, are that they are still complex from social workers and what have you. They perhaps don't want to offer them sometimes. Or they set my husband's a social worker, so I do understand it. You know, um, they're actually they're so busy, they haven't got time to get through the paperwork. So sometimes we have to go to carers and people to let them see. If this is build a bridge and let them. They will come if they know what's out there. And the only way that these entrepreneurs are going to be paid through a direct payment. Then actually, people start saying actually, and they've got that lead, that yeah. right to have a direct payment. So it is doing it from the bottom up. But we'll take a last asking. question from. Uh, is we've that kind of not? We've, kind of we've, done that we've one covered already. that one, yeah. uh, and we think we've covered your your question. Uh, 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 so we we're pretty much there now. Um, we will be um, publishing the slide. Publishing the slides. We'll sort out some of the words that were missing on one or two slides uh, and. Please do sign up to TLAP's website if you haven't already. Uh, listen to our other pod podcasts. There's uh, lots of uh, resources about this, this and other subjects on TLAP's website. Um, and hopefully you found this a really interesting, mm -hmm. stimulating subject. Oh, yes, we'll just um, throw up... Um, where, where are you going there? Uh, we're just going to throw up... Uh, there we are. That's TLAP's... Uh, contact details. Also, of course, there's been uh, Rachel's contact details will be in the slides, as will, if I can find it quickly, Helen's contact details. There we are. Yeah. So all contact details will be there and on the slides. You can listen to the, t the webinar again if you really want to. Absolutely. Um, We've enjoyed it because <laughs> well, <laughs> <absolutely. laughs> Shall we carry on? Well, we can, we can stay all afternoon if you like. But uh, anyway, we we've got we must get on. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this That's webinar. Great. Would you like to say goodbye? Goodbye. Right, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye from me. <laughs> goodbye from him. <laughs> You're showing our age now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.